This happened to me when I was 18 years old. I grew up in a house outside of a small town in North Texas. The house was out in the boonies, but there were two or three other houses within walking distance of ours. The closest place was where my best friend Chris lived. His family's property was across the road from ours and was a lot bigger. We grew up doing what typical country boys in Texas do, hunting, mudding, and playing football. I was only six the first time my dad took me out deer hunting and had my first kill by the time I was seven. Dad would have probably taken me out earlier than that if Mom would have let him. By the time I was a teenager, me and Chris were hunting by ourselves. Even though Chris had more land, we always hunted on my place. The deer didn't seem to like his property much for some reason. We always managed to get a deer the first day or two of the season on our place. But when we hunted on his property, we didn't even see a deer. I think Chris got a bit sore over it and decided to try and do something about it. The following year, Chris cleared a trail all the way back to the pond at the rear of his property. The pond sat in kind of a half moon shaped clearing. There was a steep embankment on the back side with the trees coming right up to the edge. But the front side was pretty level and sat back from the trees quite a bit. Chris had mowed down all the brush on this front side and set up a deer feeder filled with corn. Chris would go and check it about once a week and would update me on what was going on, which was nothing. I didn't expect him to have any luck. Like I said, we never even saw any deer on his place. That's why I was shocked when he told me that the deer had cleared out all the corn from the feeder. I found it kind of hard to believe since just last week it hadn't been touched, and now he was saying it was completely empty. I decided to go with him to fill the feeder back up, just to see things for myself. It was about a ten minute ride back there on a four-wheeler. When we got to the pond, not only was the deer feeder empty, but it was laying on its side. There was a little bit of corn on the ground, maybe a few handfuls if you worked for it, but other than that, it was all gone. Our best guess was that since it was empty, a big gust of wind must have somehow blown it over. Or maybe it could have been a bear. There were a few times we had seen them on our place, and they do like to tear stuff up. I helped him stand the feeder back up, and he poured what was left of a bag back into it. The feeder being emptied like that got us a little excited. If they ate that much corn that fast, there had to be a bunch of them. Maybe Deer had finally moved on to his place or just decided to hang back around the pond. We had only been back there a couple times that I could remember, and when we did try to hunt his place, it was on the complete opposite side of the property. These were the kind of answers we were coming up with to explain how 50 pounds of corn disappeared that quickly. Looking back on it now, we were idiots. But like I said, we were excited. We didn't wait a week to go check on the feeder this time. Three days later and we were headed back to the pond. When we got there, Chris slammed on the brakes of the four-wheeler, almost knocking me right off the back of it. I was about to cuss him when I noticed what he had seen. The feeder was laid over on its side, about 15 feet out into the pond. No way the wind did that, and a bear might knock it over, but a bear isn't going to carry it out to the middle of the pond. I don't think the little honey bears we have out there could even do it. I looked at Chris, halfway expecting to see that grin of his creeping across his face when he know he's pulled one over on you, but it wasn't there. I could tell instantly that he did not do this. With muddy water up to our waist, we pulled the feeder out of the pond. After further inspection, we found one of the legs was bent and the barrel that held the feed was dented. We started to brainstorm how any of this could have happened. How did the legs get bent? How did it get dented? How did it even end up in the pond? Chris cracked a joke about how it might have been a Sasquatch, but for a second I thought he was halfway serious. There were some stories from the area about people hearing strange things, and a cousin of mine swore up and down he had seen a big hairy thing on two legs back behind his trailer. I didn't think my cousin made up the story but Bigfoot was just something I'd have to see for myself to believe. Harry Ape Man or not, we had a genuine Scooby-Doo mystery on our hands and we intended on finding out what was going on. We decided that following weekend we would camp out at the pond. 
Maybe whoever or whatever it was that tore up the deer feeder would come back looking for more corn. We only had the one four-wheeler, and it took us a couple of trips to get our camping gear down to the pond. Another friend of ours named Marcus that lived nearby went with us. It felt better having another person with us, plus he had a tent big enough for all three of us and one of those high-dollar Yeti coolers. By the time we set up camp and got a fire going, the sun was already down with just a little bit of light left over the trees. Chris had brought a shotgun with us in case a bear did show up, but none of us really knew what to expect. Chris had spied the Yeti cooler Marcus brought and took the opportunity to bring up his Bigfoot theory again, but Marcus wasn't having any of it. Hours passed by and nothing happened. Marcus had already hit the tent, and it wasn't long before me and Chris joined him. We had been in the tent for maybe 30 minutes. Even though I had been tired, I was having trouble getting comfortable enough to fall asleep. I was just about there when Chris sat up real quick. Did you hear that? He asked in a loud whisper. I leaned up on my elbow and listened intently. I heard the sound of a couple of sticks breaking and then a single tone whistle. It didn't sound like a bird, it sounded like a person. Then another, this time from a different direction. I could tell they were both on the back side of the pond, but not at the same spot. We listened some more, and we heard more sticks and brush breaking on the back side of the pond, and another whistle. Chris just stared at me with his eyebrows pressed down like he was trying to figure out a math problem. I shook Marcus's arm and told him to get up. I'm awake, he said. I jumped at the sound of a loud crash on the opposite side of the pond. The three of us all sat up listening to whatever it was moving around out there. What seemed like an hour went by and things started to quiet down. I was about to lay back down when something, a stick or a small rock, hit the top of the tent. At first I just thought it was something falling from a tree but a few seconds later another one hit. Then instead of hitting the top, something hit the back of the tent. In other words, something was thrown at the tent. I think all three of us were too afraid to even breathe at that point. All we could do is just sit there in silence, listening intently to the sounds of the forest, as something threw small sticks and twigs at our tent. Then, just outside the back of the tent, we heard something sniffing, loud sniffing like a dog, only much, much louder and the breaths were much deeper. I guess Chris had all he could stand and sternly yelled, Hey! Something, whatever it was, we heard it run away from right next to the tent. And I swear to you, it sounded like it was running on two legs. That was it. There was no way we were staying the rest of the night there. We got out of the tent with our flashlights, and Chris grabbed his gun. We shined the lights around the pond and across to the embankment, but couldn't see anything. I thought for a second I saw some red eye shine, but by this point I just wanted to leave. I didn't really care what was out there. Chris started up the four-wheeler, and I hopped up on the back. Marcus grabbed his eyes chest and pulled it up on his lap, and he slid onto the back next to me. Moments later, we were headed down the trail back towards Chris's house. The trail wasn't very wide, and there were a few curvy spots where Chris had avoided large trees when he cleared it. The four-wheeler's headlights lit up the trail ahead, but behind us it was pitch black. Except every now and then when Chris would hit the brakes, lighting up everything in a red glow. As we went around one of those curvy spots, the ice chest snagged on something and started to pull off of our laps. I grabbed the handle just in time, and Marcus yelled for Chris to stop. Chris hit the brakes and Marcus tugged the ice chest back up. I looked up at the trail behind us and noticed something was blocking my view. Just a few feet away, maybe eight feet or so, something was standing there, illuminated by the brake lights. At first I was looking straight forward at its legs. They were covered in long, stringy, dark hair. I started moving my eyes up as my mind tried to figure out what I was looking at. I looked further up and saw its chest and arms, which were hanging down at its sides. The entire body was covered in the same hair, but on the chest it seemed a little thinner. 
The stomach went in and out as it took a breath. Finally, I got the courage to look at this thing's face. By the time I saw its face, my head was leaned back on my neck. I wasn't looking as much forward as I was looking up at this thing. It was huge. At first, I didn't understand what I was even looking at. All I could focus on were the eyes, which looked like shiny black marbles staring back at me. Only they looked like the size of pool balls. Then I noticed its mouth. The creature had a snout, or maybe you'd call it a muzzle. But the nose and the mouth stuck out like on a dog. It was squared off looking like our pit bull. Hair covered the snout as well, and it looked like it was caked back with blood or something. The mouth hung slightly open, and I saw two large canine teeth hanging down. It was the most terrifying thing I had ever seen, and then everything went black. Chris had let off the brakes, and we were headed for the house again. I pulled up my legs and buried my face into my arms. At any moment, I expected this thing to pull me off the back. All I could think to do was keep my head down and pray to God that he let us make it home. What was that thing? Was that a Bigfoot? Bigfoot aren't supposed to look like that. They're not supposed to look like that at all. I felt the four-wheeler come to a stop and Chris shut the motor off. We were back at the house. I didn't want to move or even look up. That thing would be standing there waiting for me. I just knew it. I felt Marcus slide off the back. I slowly looked up and saw that we were back in front of Chris's house with the porch light lighting up the driveway and the yard. We were safe. I heard Marcus ask me what was wrong. I hadn't even noticed I was crying. I just ran inside the house without saying a word. I thought if I opened my mouth I might start bawling. I felt sick to my stomach. I was terrified. What was that monster? I locked myself in the bathroom and ran the sink. I splashed water on my face and looked up at the mirror. In my mind, I saw that creature looking back at me with those solid black eyes. Chris's mom knocked on the door. Is everything all right, sugar? I hesitated, and then I said I would be out in a minute. After regaining my composure a bit, I left the bathroom and walked back out into the living room. Everyone immediately looked up at me. Chris asked, you all right, man? I just nodded and sat down in one of the recliners. Everyone sat there quietly. Chris's mom finally broke the silence and asked me what was wrong. I swallowed the lump in my throat and without looking at anyone in particular started explaining to them what I had seen. Trying to explain what the devil looks like is a hard thing to do and expecting people to believe it is even harder. As I told them what I had seen, I thought of those eyes again and started crying. They all sat there quietly, and even though what I was saying sounded crazy, they believed me. When I had finished, Chris told his mom what had happened back at camp with the whistling and the sticks being thrown at the tent. Marcus even cut in with the part about how it had felt like something had grabbed the ice chest, causing it to slide off our laps on the back of the four-wheeler. Marcus said he didn't see the creature, but that he had never looked back down the trail like I had. They also asked me some questions about what it looked like. I know it might not make sense, but I didn't think Bigfoot when I saw it. I thought werewolf. It seemed more like a dog or a wolf than a gorilla or any kind of ape. I know for sure it wasn't a bear, but what it was that I saw that night, I just really don't know. All I know is it terrified me, and it still does all these years later.